which is a, an atheist organisation um, run entirely by local volunteers. So we've heard about a few of the benefits of this wind farm from the developer, but I'd like to outline some of the environmental concerns and why we as an organisation conclude that at the moment this plan is a bad compromise for its location. So let's start with a map of the, uh, the wind farm coloured red on that, that, that map. The black line, the black outer line, is the original Zone 9, which was the area allocated by the Crown Estate in 2009, without public consultation, I have to say. And the wind farm could, in principle, have been allocated, located anywhere inside that zone. The wind farm is actually only 14.9, sorry, 14, 13.4 miles from Bournemouth, 8.9 miles from Durlston and the World Heritage Sites, and about 11 miles from the, from the needles on the Isle of Wight. And for a development of its size, that is really quite close. Um, wind farms have got bigger over time, so they need to move further out to sea in order to have a similar impact on the coast. And this one is close to shore. Um, as we've heard in Holland, uh, an eco's homeland, this, would, this wind farm would actually have to be 12 nautical miles out to sea at least, and that's about 14 miles. And the pink area at the bottom corner of the wind farm there shows you which bit of this wind farm is actually outside that 12 nautical mile limit. And that would amount to about one third of the current area. The government has made statements about the advisability of placing large wind farms close to the shore. And it has made a recommendation that basically to avoid potential public opposition and extended consenting timescales on these very large round three wind farms, it's advisable to keep them outside this 12 nautical mile limit. And we can see that's not happening here. The development sort of sits inside an arc of coastline from Purbeck around coast through Bournemouth and then onto the Isle of Wight and in that sense it's badly situated because it affects a much longer stretch of coastline than it would if it was off an isolated headland for example. And the coast is generally elevated along much of its length. We have cliffs along most of the coastline that is inside of the wind farm and that of course reduces the ability of curvature of the earth to hide the wind farm over the horizon and in fact from some viewpoints the entire array is visible right down to sea level so there's no mitigation there at all. There are also very important nationally designated landscapes. We have um, the Isle of Wight area of outstanding natural beauty, the New Forest National Park, the Dorset area of outstanding natural beauty and England's only world, natural world heritage site, the Jurassic Coast. And these designations are supposed to be given the highest level of protection. They were selected for good reasons and a lot of public money um, goes into maintaining them. In a small crowded nation like ours, these special areas have exceptional national importance and we have a duty to protect them if we can. We should also not forget the marine environment. These blue areas show the marine protected zones in, this, in our region. And there are four main ones and there are actually more planned. And when you look at that map, you begin to wonder why it was ever considered sensible to place such a large industrial development inside that ring of protected designations. <coughs> It's quite hard to get a grasp of how big that wind farm is, so I've just transplanted the area onto Pool and Bournemouth. And you can see that it would stretch from Sandbanks across to Christchurch, up to um, West Moors, across to Wingbourne, and then back down through Pool. So it easily, easily swallows <coughs> the whole of Fern down Pool and Bournemouth. It's a big area. And actually, if it was built today, that would be the world's biggest offshore wind farm. There are bigger ones planned. Turbines have got bigger over the years as well, which is one reason why they need to be moved further from the coast. 
this is a, a graphic showing a comparison with the Gherkin in London, big office building, which I'm sure you've seen. And down at the bottom, a 37 foot yacht. And if you can see it at all, right at the bottom, the double decker London bus. So you can see these are very large structures which can be seen at long range. Many environmental concerns have been raised in consultation by the public, by us, and also by organisations such as Natural England. So many, in fact, that I can't cover all of them in 12 minutes. But NBDL's environmental statement is a good place to start if you want more information. I'll try to identify a few, issue, few key issues there. Onshore works. Um, there will be a new seven and a half acre substation complex at Mannington linked to the coast by high voltage cable routes. And the greatest disruption comes from laying the cables across 22 miles of our countryside. This is not a trivial operation, as this slide suggests, although MBDL's trenching tech whoops, sorry, although MBDL's trenching technique may be different from the one shown here shown here. Um, trees have to be felled, hedgerows have to be cut, channels have to be dug, and the cables cannot have large trees growing over them again. So the landscape is changed semi-permanently. Even ignoring the access roads and the works compounds, the, disturb the ground disturbance is equivalent in width to an eight-lane motorway with hard shoulders. Seven protected areas would be crossed by the, um, by the cable route, and the damage, damage to them would clearly result. So the cable route in itself is a major um, civil engineering programme. So what about the offshore works? Well, in fact, the majority of the, uh, the, majority of the work is offshore, of course, and it's easy for that to be out of sight and out of mind. It would be a massive industrial development in a currently undeveloped environment. And a recent study has shown that the area between Purbeck and the Isle of Wight is a hotspot for marine life in the southwest. So its protection is important nationally. It's not an ecological desert out there. The key issues really here are uh, noise, underwater noise, especially during piling, which would last perhaps four or five seasons. Noise, as you know, can travel great distances underwater, and therefore it affects a wide area. At short range, pile driving noise can be lethal. It can kill outright some marine organisms or it can injure organisms. But more generally, fish and marine mammals would be deterred from a wide area during construction. <laughs> Sediment from trenching, drilling, piling, dumping can drift quite long distances in the tidal currents before settling out as well. And if enough sediment is deposited, it smothers the seabed and kills the, all the life on the seabed. And that affects the whole of the local ecosystem. A noise, sediment, general disturbance can displace the species from their normal living and feeding areas or their spawning grounds, which Mike has mentioned already, or their migration routes. But humans are not the only species who don't like noise and disturbance. And this is potentially serious, especially when it happens in successive breeding seasons. Habitats are obviously directly damaged as well by cable trenching, being covered by rock armour or drill spoil, and by the placement of turbine foundations themselves. Um, and because the seabed is quite hard in this area, it tends to be coarse gravels underlying uh, uh, rock, the damage is slower to recover, if it can at all, than it would be if the bottom were sandy or silty like it is in much of the North Sea, for example. So how much area is affected? Well, quite a bit. Um, using MBDR's environmental data, we've estimated that at least 5 million square metres of seabed would be directly affected by the digging of cables and so on. And somewhere around half a million tonnes of alien rock would have to be brought into the area to protect cables from uh, damage by anchors and things like that. And um, that rock would be very hard to remove on decommissioning. It's hard to see how you would pick up half a million tonnes of rock from the seabed. And even if you did, where would you put it? 
And there's also a question of whether the seedling could actually recover after that much damage. And if this, if this level of destruction were occurring on land, where we could see it, I'm sure there'd be a much louder outcry. Visual impact is obviously an important issue for many of us. Uh, here's a photograph of the Isle of Wight taken from the BIC here. I've put two black lines on it just as a reference. The top black line is the height that a blade tip would reach, as you see from Bournemouth, that's the 8 megawatt turbine. And the lower black line is the height of the hub. So next time you're out walking, try to remember that comparison and just mentally have a look at the Isle of Wight and try and imagine the height of a turbine. The array itself is not close to the needle, so I hasten to add. It would be right out in the middle of the bay. It would cover about a third of the horizon between uh, the Isle of Wight and Purbeck, and it's more or less due south, straight as you look out, straight out from the shore. Also remember that the visual pit impact here is significantly less than it would be in the Swanage area, because Swanage is significantly closer to the array. From the pier area of Bournemouth, for example, you should be able to see the wind farm whenever you can see the Isle of Wight, and I think people who, know, who live here know how frequently that happens. And they would be at similar distances. Dr. Uh, the two minute warning. At night, we expect that least all the peripheral turbines will carry red navigation lights and will flash in synchronism, so you're going to see them there as well. So are landscapes worth protecting? Well, we think they are. And what's the point of having designated landscapes if you're not prepared to look after them? And protecting some special landscapes is surely an important part of taking care of the environment for the future. Landscapes have all sorts of values, uh, including financial value. And as we've heard, part of the wealth of our region derives from our surroundings and the benefits we derive from them. And our visitors also derive those benefits. And it's also worth remembering that the developer doesn't bear the risk in negative outcomes. We do. The community does. Um, and we should expect to be fully informed about gains and losses so we can make our own minds up about the desirability of this development. <clears throat> Just going back to the national picture for a moment, the UK has already allocated a huge area of seabed, bigger than the whole of Wales, for future wind farm development. And those areas are shown in magenta on that map. The truly big areas, truly vast areas, are in the North Sea and the Irish Seas. And the total capacity of these areas is bigger than the grid could cope with. The North Sea alone could generate 20 times as much power as Navitas Bay. And some areas are available for use, but are not currently being developed. Note how these zones are much further offshore and would be barely visible or invisible from the coasts. The government has plans actually to link the North Sea zones into an offshore grid, which would be shared internationally with Denmark and Germany and places like that, and also possibly the Irish Sea zone. And this allows spreading of supply and demand across more than one country, reduces duplication of equipment, reduces variability of supply, reduces the number of onshore connections. And importantly, that synergy also reduces costs. I've nearly finished. Isolated wind farms can't participate in those schemes, of course. So we have choices about where we build offshore wind farms. Not every plan is a good one, and the government clearly expected attrition in the planning process, as otherwise there wouldn't be a consultation process. And every wind farm will have negative environmental impacts, just like any large industrial development. But they also have benefits. But nationally, we should be seeking a solution that minimises the negative impacts, both environmental and financial. And isolated wind farms like Navasus Bay, in highly sensitive locations, are not the best compromise. So that we have to conclude that, in simple terms, Navasus Bay is just a bad plan and in the wrong place. Thank you very much.